guys. Welcome back. It's uh, David Rice here as usual with my partner in crime from the Colorado area. Kevin Henry, how are you? Hey, I am good, my friend. Good to see you. Uh, I know you're in Florida and I know the lady that we're going to talk to today is in California. So we got three of the time zones taken care of here. And that is the awesome Leslie Canham, one of the infection control uh, experts out there. Leslie, thanks so much for being on today. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for inviting me. You know, and I think one of the biggest questions that Dave and I wanted to talk to you about today, and, you know, we're both going to uh, kind of pepper you with some questions on this, is the, the fact of aerosols in, in the operatory. And I think there's a lot of conflicting information out there. And, and I know I've been getting some questions about it from dental assistants, and I'm sure Dave has from the dentist side as well. What are some things that, that you're hearing and we need to emphasize whenever it comes to aerosols uh, in the operatory right now? Well, the first thing that I hear, and actually I've been hearing this since about the beginning of March when we were still actually on site in our practices, uh, people were concerned about what's in the aerosols and, and if they could protect themselves well enough with their surgical face masks. And beyond that, uh, a lot of people are not aware that there are different levels of mask protection. So with level one mask, uh, it's low protection, level two, moderate protection, and level three is high protection for aerosols that are generated in a typical dental setting. Now, 95% uh, of aerosols are filtered by your typical surgical face mask. And the higher the level, the better efficiency and better uh, filtration it has, as well as better moisture efficiency. So when you're using, uh, let's say, ultrasonic scalers or hand pieces, the higher level mask is better protection. Sounds good. And, and, and I wanted to ask, and, and Dave, I don't want to steal your thunder here, but I want to ask about HVE yeah. with aerosols, because I know there's been some talk about how that can help minimize it, but I obviously want to pick the expert's brain here and, and see what you know about that. Well, you know, there's nothing better than being able to really use your high velocity evacuator appropriately. And uh, I know when I first started out as a young dental assistant, uh, it was a challenge. I, I managed to have cheeks and lips and tongue and everything else get sucked up into that high velocity evacuator. And then when I finally got in my uh, assisting skills dialed in, uh, I was able to efficiently do the job and reduce the number of aerosols. And you know, besides having a, a individual, a person uh, evacuate, there are devices you know, that isolate other types of suction uh, devices that could be attached to a high velocity evacuator that will uh, really reduce the aerosols. I like that. So, you know, Leslie, as we talk about that, you know, you talk about a rubber dam isolation and, you know, that traditional form versus an isolate out there versus, you know, what we do on our own, you know, how much better are we when we have either an isolate in our hands or a rubber dam at controlling the well, field I, and controlling the aerosol? When, when I think about a rubber dam that I feel like it, just in think, looking at it from a physics standpoint, it is, it is certainly helping the patient and isolating the field. So there's less oral fluids that are being generated, but if you're using any kind of uh, spray with the with your handpiece then again having the great um, use of a high velocity evacuator is going to be very very helpful in that case so certainly those types of controls are called engineering controls to reduce the amount of aerosols that are generated and to reduce the amount of oral fluids that are combined and commingled with those aerosols is your best step so the engineering controls rubber dam work practice controls, uh, really getting good with the use of that, uh, that high velocity evacuator. I like it. Yeah, and, and Leslie, obviously, you know, we take things from the dental assistant side and obviously, you know, you have that background as well. So this is something that assistants, you know, I hate to say that they should be well versed in, uh, you know, but, but as good as they can be in this right now, that's really gonna be a key, I think, whenever practices ramp back up into production mode, is that correct? Right, absolutely. We're gonna to have to be very good at our skills, not only on, on uh, our chair side techniques, but we're also going to need to be uh, really diligent on getting back to the basis with our disinfection techniques and, and uh, maybe even our communication skills with our patients, because not only are we at risk, but you know our patients have gotta be thinking, what about when I go to the dentist? Am I safe when I go to the dentist? Absolutely. 
For sure. And, you know, Kev, I'll piggyback on what you and Leslie were sharing from the restorative side, assistant and dentist. Um, you know, the hygiene side, my gosh, is an incredible area where we don't normally do this, right? We have that usually that slow speed evacuation going on. It's hanging over here. And the, I, you know, I as a patient, and it never bothers me, but like, you know, the plume is everywhere. So using that high speed evacuation system in hygiene with ultrasonics, I think now more than ever, is going to become really important, especially to your point, Leslie. Right. And the hygienists are certainly the ones that are going to have uh, the aerosols. They a lot of times don't have an assistant to assist with high velocity evacuation. So uh, manipulating the high velocity evacuator at the same time that they're cleaning teeth, and it may be a little cumbersome, but uh, could be a learning curve worth, uh, worth learning. Uh, the other part of that is they, for protecting themselves, uh, a level three mask. I would recommend that hygienists uh, who have uh, high aerosols from ultrasonic scaler or power scalers use a level three mask. And one thing that surprises me is that when I visit dental offices, a lot of times they'll have masks that are the least expensive kind, and they're not even rated. Uh, and masks are cleared by the Food and Drug Administration, and, and they have a level of rating that is, uh, that is sort of overseen by the American Standards and Testing, or ASPM, Standard Testing Materials. And so that's where they get their rating. And uh, over the last two years, I've had a number of hygienists asking me for any kind of documentation, anything that they can use to go to their employers and say, I really need to have a level three mask. So it would be helpful to do that and to have that. And then one other thing that I might add to uh, future use, uh, and when we come back into the practices again, is to uh, consider wearing a face shield over your level three mask to reduce the aerosols that you're breathing as well. Great, great tips. And, and Leslie, I know that you are, are very active in OSAP, which is a great resource for all dental practices. Uh, where are you keeping up with, with information? Because like you said, when, before we started talking, this is something that changes almost every day as far as what we should be doing or what maybe a recommendation might be. Well, number one is OSAP. You're absolutely right, Kevin. Uh, that is, in my opinion, the one-stop shopping place for everything infection control and safety in dentistry, exclusively for dentistry. And then uh, there's also Centers for Disease Control, the CDC website. They're updating regularly, and they have uh, various sections, uh, including our basic infection prevention recommendations that we've had since 2003, and an update, a beautiful checklist in 2016. But they also have interim guidance that uh, not only for uh, healthcare providers, but they've got guidance for us in dentistry. And there's a recent uh, posting on the CDC website. So that's a good place to go. American Dental Association is uh, very, doing a very good job of updating their website regularly with COVID-19 resources. But um, I just wanna share a little uh, something with the people that are listening today. Uh, OSAP has opened up their website to everybody. And I used to think, well, OSAP is my secret sauce. I mean, if anybody wanted to become an infection control consultant or speaker, really almost all they have to do is go to OSAP and, and attend the meetings and, and, and use the website and use the resources because that is my number one toolkit. And uh, OSAP has made that toolkit available to everybody for free. Not only is it free to look at every single part of their website that normally members have to pay for, not a lot for membership. It's, I think it's $135 or thereabouts for a membership to OSAP. But uh, they also have links to all of those resources that I mentioned, ADA websites, CDC. If you're concerned about disinfectants, there's a link to the EPA website with the latest information about disinfectants that, that you may want to uh, peruse to see how your disinfectant measures up against coronavirus. I think that's so important, Leslie. I think all too often in dentistry, although we've done a much better job over the years with infection control, it's almost become this, it's just something we check off in order to do the procedure. And let's be honest, there are some practices that check off with lesser quality um, products and because they're less expensive. And you know, the, the, the salesperson who's coming to you trying to sell you that mask that isn't this mask or this mask or this mask, 
and maybe they're off label and maybe it's online and I'm not saying all that stuff's bad, but there's a reason, you know, quality reps who work for, you know, our friends at Patterson and all these other companies, like there's a reason a level three mask costs what it costs. It's doing a better That's job. Right. Keeping you safe. So that, yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Yeah, David, you're, you're absolutely right when it comes to making sure that we're not being penny wise and pound foolish and, and trying to cut corners, especially when it comes to protection of our workforce and protection of our patients. And one thing I might add is that our patients have now got a big education on the word infection control. They have been hearing all about hand hygiene and PPE. It used to be, I'd have to explain what PPE meant. That there isn't anybody that doesn't know what PPE means. Yeah. So they're gonna be watching us from everything we do, from hand hygiene to how we're dressed, to how we respond to their questions, to uh, making sure that, uh, that our infection control measures up to what they've been hearing about this last three or four weeks on television while they've been hearing about the uh, infection prevention mechanisms that they can use at home too. I totally agree. Now, you know, more than ever, I think the number one thing on a patient's mind when they walk in our practice is, am I safe here today? So all this matters. Kevin, thoughts? You know, I, I always learn something whenever I, I am around Leslie, and I, I'm, I'm thankful that even across the miles we got to do this today. And make sure, uh, you know, lesliecanum.com is her website. Uh, we're going to put all the information below so that you can reach out to Leslie and, and learn more about what she does. And in this time, it's so important. Don't trust somebody on Facebook who's saying they think they know what they're doing. This is the time that you go to Leslie and the experts at OSAP who are out there and who've been doing this for years to keep you up to date on things. So Leslie, really appreciate you being on today. Thanks so much. My pleasure. So nice to see you. Stay safe, Kevin. Stay safe, David. And say hi to Anastasia and of course, Gibbs. Uh, and I, Dana too. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.